Today I would like to tell you the story about how SQL evolved in the past 20 years. And to do so, we need to establish some common grounds between us. And these common grounds are basically SQL 92. This is what most people have learned when they learned SQL. And yeah, therefore I would like to immediately skip over when it works. Oh, yeah. Um, out of the four decades of history we have of SQL, we're skipping immediately to the year uh, 1992, when SQL 92 was released by the International Standards Organization. And one important idea at the beginning of SQL was that it was tied to the relational idea. And the relational idea consists of two important sub-ideas. The first one is the relational data model. And the original idea in the relational data model was that it said, we have in each cell, in each table, so when you have the intersection between a column and a row in one cell, what can you put in there? And the original definition of the relational model said an atomic type, one value of an atomic type. So if you have a table like this, you can put um, values in there like um, strings, numbers, dates, things like that. And the second part of this relational data model is that the schema itself should be designed independent of what you plan to do with the data. That's very crucial. It should be normalized away from what you want to do with the data, because quite often you don't know yet what you're going to do with the data. And if you're following these two rules, then you end up with a schema design where you have your data spread across many tables. Who knows that already? Of course. And quite often, even for a single business requirement, when you're implementing one business requirement, you need data stored in different tables. And that is awkward. Therefore, we have the second part of the relational idea, which is the relational operations. These are transformation steps which help you to transform the normalized persistent data into something that is more suitable to process in your client application for each different business need. So if you have one business case, then you might transform it like um, in, in one way, using the relational operations like join, union, and so on. And if you have the next business requirement, you just transform it differently, and so on. So this is the important idea of what SQL is actually, what the, the key idea behind SQL was to do these transformations. OK, my reception is not very good on the clicker, sorry. So SQL is meant to be this transformation tool, where you transform on the fly from the persistent normalized structure into something more uh, useful in your client code. So this is basically the common grounds I wanted to establish. So let's skip over to the next release of the ISO standard of SQL, which was released in 99. And it starts with great news, maybe. Here it is. Great news. The relational data model is dead, was the title of a paper published around the time when SQL 99 came out. And of course, it's a very clickbait title. I mean, the relational data model is dead. Yeah, great. Um, but yeah, let's look inside. I took two quotes out of that to see what actually happened there. And the first quote is, to say that these SQL 99 extensions are a mere extended interpretation of the relational data model. It's like saying an intercontinental ballistic missile is merely an extended interpretation of a spear. So apparently, there is something which is called an extended interpretation of the relational data model. On the other hand, there is the argument that is more than just that. And the second quote is, with SQL 99, you can have the best of both worlds, and you can have the worst of both worlds. It's up to the database practitioners to do the right thing. So there are now two ways to approach each problem, and it's up to you to choose which one is more appropriate. So what, what does that actually mean? Let's look at this relational model thing, extended interpretation of the relational model. So um, Chris Date, a database scientist, wrote about that, so I would like to quote him. And he said, I was confused as anyone else. Yeah, well, what was he confused about? And what he was confused about are these atoms. 
What does it mean, an atomic type? If I have a string, I can uh, split it into characters. Clearly, it is not atomic. If I follow this argument, you will end up that the only truly atomic thing and in information is the bit. But if we think that this, this word, atomic types, was used to describe what can go into one table cell, well, it doesn't make sense to only have one bit in one table cell. So clearly, this is not how it was meant. And very much like we are defining the kilogram more precisely nowadays, he wanted, or they wanted, to define this, this relational data model more precisely. And we're searching for some better exp uh, expression than atomic. And what he eventually found was domains can contain anything. And in this context, domains means just types can be anything. It doesn't matter what we store in each cell. It's still fine. And SQL 99 took that idea and started to introduce rich data types. It is, it is, of course, still allowed to use those atomic types in tables. Strings are still fine, no question. But now we also have arrays. These were strictly prohibited originally. No repeating groups was in the original definition of the relational data model. This is gone. And it goes even further. SQL 99 introduced nested tables. So we can have entire tables in a single cell. And of course, we can have um, com composite types. Ah, yeah, yeah, we have. So composite types like objects. Sorry, that was too fast. Composite types like objects. Sorry, it doesn't work so well. So we can have something like a monetary value, like an object-oriented programming, where we combine the numeric value together with the, with the currency and can put that into a single column. And when we do then transformations on that using SQL, because SQL is meant to be a transformation language as well, then we even enjoy type safety on these composite types. So this was the extended interpretation of the relational data model. And on the other hand, SQL 99 also introduced more non-relational transformation operations. One of them is the transitive closure, which I would like to introduce here. So if you think of a hierarchy, a graph, a hierarchy basically, um, where each of the nodes is represented as a single row in one table, having a, a parent pointer, like I have here on the screen. Then you can, of course, pick out any of these nodes, if you know, for example, the ID, let's say 42. And then you might have questions like, um, what are all the descendant nodes? And how to do that in SQL? So this is what I would like to show you um, by example if it works. So the first part is still very easy, selecting the first one. If you know the ID, you just select it by the ID. And the next step is basically to use the union operator we already have in SQL um, 92 and say, instead of searching for this ID, if we say this is 42, we can also look for all the nodes whose parent ID is 42. And then we get the second level. But of course, this doesn't scale because we cannot add a third level this way unless we have something like grandparent pointers, which we, of course, don't have. So what we would need to implement that, we would need some way that we can reuse the output of our very own query as the input for that query again. So that when, if we find one node, that we can, in the next step, search for all the nodes that point to that, who have this as parent. And this is exactly what SQL 99 introduced with recursive queries. The syntax is not even a lot. The only important point here is actually this indirect pointer here, pref.id, refers basically to its own output and therefore hits all the descendant nodes in one query, in one go. They all ship over to your application and you are done. So this was just one of these um, things introduced with SQL 99, and yeah, it was introduced about here, and in the meanwhile, pretty much every database can do that. So then, I would like to skip over all the other standards that were released in the middle and go directly to the latest one, 2016. So the current SQL standard is 2016, and there we have got JSON. So 
we already know that this atomic thinking of um, or we can only have atomic values in the relational data model is gone. Of course, we can store JSON documents in single cells, and it's even valid. It's not breaking any rules. What we have got with SQL 2016 is that SQL itself has semantic understanding for these things. SQL now knows what this square bracket means and what this curly bracket means and what this colon means. We can now ask, how many elements does this uh, JSON document have? And we can create JSON documents out of more atomic table designs, like I have it on the right-hand side. And of course, we can transform JSON documents in the other way, in both ways, it is supported. And what I would like to show to you is now, if you transform a JSON document into something more atomic, like the table design you have there. And for that, we have a new function. It's called JSON table. It needs a few arguments. The first one is, of course, the JSON document itself. And then there comes something called SQL JSON path expression. And that's a small language of its own. And it serves the very same purpose like XPath for XML, or like um, uh, CSS selectors for HTML. So it is a way to match some elements out of a JSON document. And the expression I have here on the screen basically says, give me all the elements of this array. It hits two members, which in turn are transformed into two rows. So each of this element, which is hit by this expression, will be transformed in one row. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> OK, so once we have defined which rows we would like to have, the only thing left is to define the columns. Therefore, we have the columns class where we can set the names and the types, and we can use this JSON path language again to say which values to put into these columns. Yeah, well, and this was, is just one example of what has been introduced into SQL 2016 into the international SQL standard. So 2016 is, of course, just two years ago. So it's not that widely supported yet, but I know at least one other database, Postgres namely, is already working on that, and I guess the other ones um, will do it also quite soon. So to conclude on this, this discussion, here's a picture of one part of the SQL standard as it is right now. Um, it consists of nine parts, and in total, it has about 10 times as many pages as SQL 92 used to have. So it's about 10 times as much. And from SQL 99 on, it was not limited anymore to this relational idea. It does still implement it, but the rest, which has been added since then, is not limited to that idea. So 90% of the current standard are not originated in the relational idea. A lot has happened since SQL 92. Another important thing I would like you to take away from this short session is that SQL has really, really evolved beyond the relational data model. If you think um, the relational data model is um, uh, not a good fit for you, for your requirement, it does not automatically mean SQL is not a good fit because SQL can do so much more. And last but not least, if you're using SQL only to do CRUD operations, like creating entities, reading them, updating them, deleting them, mostly by ID, then you are doing it wrong. From the beginning, SQL was meant to be the transformation language between some data schema, how it is persisted, to something which is more convenient to process in your application for each and every dif different business requirement you have. So nowadays, it's quite popular to say REST APIs are a dull way to access data, and GraphQL is the way to go. This is basically the same argument. It's just that SQL is more mature and more powerful. So what's left to, to do? You just have to learn modern SQL. That's it. And to do so, one way to do so is just to visit my website, modernsql.com, subscribe it, and learn how it is working nowadays and don't believe SQL got stuck in that year 92. My name is Markus Wienand. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>